and talk to you today. Uh, I spent uh, off and on good parts of my uh, of my youth uh, running amok in, uh, in this fine city, and uh, and as I look out and see uh, a few mature uh, audience members, I want to remind you that I think. The statute of limitations is over. Um, I've outlived that if I broke out your windows. Uh, uh, I guess I'm okay, all right? Um, yeah, Steve Lowe's all right. Uh, my home is in Polson. And, uh, and I have to tell you that Butte, and you probably hear this all the time, but Butte is my favorite place in the whole world. And, uh, and it... Uh, it, it, it means so much to me and to my extended family. Uh, just a little bit of introduction. Um, I'm the grandson, great-grandson of uh, Josef Lozar, a Slovene immigrant who uh, came to the United States, specifically Montana, in the late 1800s. And his wife, Caroline von Stangl, um, they grew up about 15 kilometers from each other in Slovenia. And, um, and met in East Helena. Uh, met in East Helena. Uh, she came as a 13-year-old and was, uh, was uh, what was in those days called the illegitimate child of a wealthy uh, landowner. And she was a saintly woman. We all knew her very well. She uh, didn't speak English, but she came to, uh, came to East Helena on steerage out of uh, Trieste. And, um, and made it all the way to East Helena, which had an ethnic uh, enclave of uh, miners and smelter workers that, um, that had immigrated from the same part of Central, Central Europe that she did. Joe Lozar, the same thing. And they met, they, uh, they married, they had five, five daughters and one son. The tradition in Slovenia is to name your oldest son. How many Slovenes do we have in here? All right. I know one for sure because one that raised their hand is my cousin. It shares, it shares this same uh, the same heritage, and he is a uh, a multi generational uh, The tradition is to name your oldest son after the parish church, and uh, and I am Stephen, named after the church in uh, in Nova Mesto. And uh, and like to the church in uh, Chernobyl, so uh, so my kids have been back to the church. I'm Stephen, named after Saint Stephen. So you'll see how saintly this gets here as we talk about here. Uh, but uh, my grandfather, first Lozar male, born in America, and uh, he's named Stephen. My dad, Stephen, my myself, Stephen. We went by Chico, Buddy, and Bugs. <laughs> <laughs> we could sit in view, huh? Everybody <laughs> has one of those kind of names. Yeah. Uh, it, it was a great way to grow up, and we spent a lot of time here, and, uh, and we would often go to, uh, we're, we're starting to work in that Pivo into the talk here. We, uh, we spent a lot of time uh, over at our cousins in Lescobars. And uh, they lived on, uh, on Cherry and Plum, uh, the family uh, was uh, were residents of McQueen. Anybody remember McQueen? I know that some of you, some of you definitely remember McQueen. What a neat place! What a fantastic place! And we would sit down for dinner at uh, Uncle Tony's house, and everybody from toddlers to octogenarians had one of these sitting at their table, place table. Huh? Didn't matter how old you were. You sat down, and for the proper meal, you had what? You had a bottle of beer. What a great way to raise a family, huh? <laughs> yeah, maybe. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. And my wife and I incidentally raised our kids the same way. And, uh, and so, uh, so we would sit down, and, uh, and Uncle Tony would say the grace. We kids weren't allowed to talk, the little ones. He would say the grace. He had a tray of little chalices, and uh, Nancy, you might remember all of this too. And he would pour Chianti in, into, those, uh, into those little uh, little chalices, pass them around, say the grace, and then follow with Nazadravye. Huh? Nazadravye. Everybody would drink it, and then we would start the meal. How 
wonderful when you're a little kid to be able to grow up in that kind of a culture. And we were blessed. Every one of us were blessed. We also had the opportunity to start drinking beer. Huh? And that's why we're here today, to talk about beer. Well, I have, uh, I have in Polson, and you're all invited. In fact, is, let's get a bus this afternoon. We'll, 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 we'll get a couple of cases, and we'll all drive to, to Polson. I, I have the Joe Lozar's, uh, Joe Lozar's Montana Brewery Museum in Polson. And uh, it's free, it's open to the public. It has, a, uh, it has a research area in it that you can come in and learn about brewing history in Montana. And, uh, and it is absolutely a passion. I spend a lot of time there. I spend a lot of time studying about Montana brewing history. And so I do these kind of talks often, often. And, uh, and, and so it's always an honor, but a special honor to come to Beat America and be able to talk about brewing history of this place because it's rich, it's dynamic, it was tough, it was dirty, it was wonderful. So let me just start out by saying that, um, that brewing history in Montana mirrors the history of the state and the history of the territory. Every, every mining camp, every cow town, every logging camp, Every municipality had what? A brewery. A brewery. A brewery. One of the very first things that went into town, or went into the camp. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> if you were, if you in the 1800s wanted to, wanted to sell, uh, sell real estate here in Butte, would you say we have great employment? We have, uh, we have, oh. Sorry, my, my pleasure was ringing there. Um, it goes off in my head every once in a while, so if it happens again, bear with me. Um, if you were gonna sell real estate, you wouldn't talk about all the amenities of town. One of the very first things you would do, our old Montana real estate campus are full of this, is you would announce to the potential buying public that you have a what? Brewery. You have an operating brewery. It brought legitimacy to, uh, to all the Bergs camps and towns in Montana. Believe me, Butte was a very legitimate place. How, how many breweries do you think, not counting the three that are operating now, how many breweries do you think were housed here in this town? And we'll stretch all the way up to Walkerville. Huh? We'll go clear up to Walkerville, and we'll go even go over to, to German Gulch. You know where German Gulch is? Yeah, okay, how many? 39. Were you at their talk last night? <laughs> because if you were, you're absolutely right. <laughs> I explained last night how smart you people were. And when you know that there were 39 breweries here in Butte, that's indicative of all of you. So all feel good about yourself right now. You know how many breweries there were in Butte. All the, all the populations that continue to grow, what was going on? What was going on? Folks were immigrating from Central, Eastern Europe, a few from other countries, or from other areas, but uh, what did they want to do when they came to, uh, came to America? They wanted to be Americans, huh? They wanted to be Americans. And, but when they moved to <coughs> what did they end up doing? Well, they brought their religion. What else did they bring? They brought their taste for food, they brought their societies, their, uh, they brought their taste for beer. 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 Oh, okay. <laughs> You're smart, but you don't participate. <laughs> okay. Yeah, their, their taste for beer. And we're talking about you today, so where they came in, this town was made up of those wonderful, I'm not telling you anything new, this was made up of those wonderful ethnic enclaves. Huh? And right off the bat, one of the things we think of is that um, each of those ethnic enclaves had their own taste for beer and therefore favored whom? Favored those brewers that came over to earn a living by selling that taste of the old country right back to the folks who are just the new Americans. Makes sense, doesn't it? It makes sense. Yeah, yeah. 
Now, uh, some of us are multicultural and we'll drink just about anything. <laughs> but, uh, but in the 1800s, people were very, very loyal to, to their beer. So what did you do? What uh, ethnic enclaves? Uh, what does that mean? What does that mean exactly? How many of you grew up your whole life in beer? Huh? Yeah. When I was a kid, the, uh, one of the things that uh, everybody had or went by a um, went by an ethnic an ethnic slur, huh? They weren't really slurs in those days. Not the way we think of them today. I'm a practicing anthropologist. I would never use an ethnic slur to put somebody down, but that's how people self-identified here in Butte, right? Mm -hmm. huh? To the Irish, by God, they were Irish here, huh? Up in Walkerville, Corktown, Dublin Gulch. Mm -hmm. I'm an Irishman. Did anybody else call you an Irishman here in Butte? <laughs> huh? Oh my God, my Annie would tell us, my Aunt Annie Lescobar would tell us, don't you kids, because we ran everywhere, don't you kids go with to Corktown? Don't go to Dublin Gulch? Oh, Those mix are all there. <laughs> Those mix are all there. And for God's sakes, don't go to Walkerville. They'll beat you up. <laughs> Where did we go, by the way? Walkerville. We headed for Walkerville. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, incidentally, I married one of those mix. Uh, I married Nick, and it's, it's been wonderful. Married for 45 years. Um, out in East Butte, in, uh, in McQueen, out in that area, what were we called out there? Dagos. The Dagos were generally in Peterville, and they, they crossed over to East Butte, yes, of course. And even a few on the, uh, a few uh, there in uh, on the very eastern end. What were we called? Bohunks. Bo the Bohunkus. Huh? Yeah, remember the Bohunkus dances? Huh? Yeah. Did we take a certain amount of pride in that? Yes. Yes, we did self identify. The Italians, they, they had, uh, they were called dagos, huh? My God. Hey, I'm, I'm an anthropologist, only, only reporting the facts, man. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a real pride in that. And the pride extended to the beer that you drank. And a number of years ago, I wrote a, I wrote the center uh, article for the, um, for the uh, Montana Magazine of Western History on the ethnicity of brewing in Butte. And in the, uh, in the 1800s, early 1900s, you could look at a man or a woman uh, out here in Butte, and, and, uh, and if, if, uh, if I was tipping this bottle to my lips, huh? that's kind of pitiful, isn't it? Tipping, tipping <laughs> an empty bottle in Butte. Uh, if I were actually doing that, what could you tell about me? You could tell about where I lived in town, by the brand I was tipping. Uh, what else? You could tell what parish I belonged to, or what church I belonged to. Probably what job I held in the mines. I don't even have to be tipping it. If you just look down the street into the tavern I walked into, and you saw um, horses, certain colored horses delivering the beer wagons, you could make all those inferences too. And generally, you would be right. You would be right. Why was that? Because Butte was again so attached to their their uh, their ethnic taste, huh? and so if a German brewer was brewing beer, as in this case, huh, then that would tell me something about who that person is. Isn't it great to make generalizations about people, huh? <laughs> and throw in an ethnic name? <laughs> oh my God, that's really something, isn't it? It was, it was a sign of pride. We had mostly, we had mostly German brewers with that tradition here in Butte. We, and we had the who? We had the Irish, right? Okay. And, uh, and, and they influenced society around here because many of the early brewers became politicians. Huh? Now I know the statute of limitations hasn't run out on those guys. <laughs> not, certainly not today. But what were they? They were politicians here in Butte, and they, they helped grow the town. And as the town grew, they sold more and more what? They sold
sold more and more beer. Yeah, you can see those those wonderful ties. Who's been down to uh, Williamsburg? Huh? You know where that's at? Huh? I, I just I just drove around there today this morning before I came. I always go over there. But what's unique about it? What is it? Street names. The street names are unique. What are the street names there? They're all German street names, right? Do you know why that area, what that area initially was used for? Huh? So, somebody, somebody nod. <laughs> this thing on, hello. Yeah, lots of brewery workers lived there. They had, uh, they, they could look from, uh, they could look from their houses back towards Butte here, and they could see the, uh, they could see the Centennial Brewery. Could actually walk. There were no freeway there, obviously. They could walk to work. Nice, huh? They could look and they could see the. Uh, they could see the. I can't see it, but <laughs> they could see. Oh, they could see the Olympia Brewery, huh? Right up above, right up above the Centennial. Yeah. What did they do? They came. They were Americans, but they still stayed in those same kinds of areas. I think it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful to be able to self-identify. Now, okay, we've established we've ethnicity. We've established there were how many breweries? Did you say? Thirty-nine. <laughs> Thirty-nine. All right. Well, you guys are retaining this. This is great. Last night at the brewery, there wasn't much retention, but there was, there was a lot of joy. Um, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about let's talk about slogans. That kind of brewery slogans. Anybody remember any brewery slogans around here? A million glasses a day. <laughs> a million glasses a day. Really? Someone must like it. Huh? Isn't that a great slogan? Which yeah. That was the centennial. Oh. That was the centennial. A million glasses a day. Someone must like it. Wow. Yeah. Everybody here knows uh, that if you've lived in Butte or even passed through, you know Taffer Light. Um, yep. Yeah. Everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. Ties you with beer, and it ties you with the mines, obviously. Huh? Well, what are a couple other ones? How about Butte beer? Get it? Got it? Good. <laughs> Get it? Got it? Good. Hey, the Butte Brewery stole that, by the way. How many of you remember back in the fifties a? Uh, a, uh, a movie called The Court Jester. Danny, Danny, what's his name? Danny Kane? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so every kid running around Butte after that movie played up here was saying, get it, got it, good. <laughs> huh? Why not take that saying and add it to what? Uh, let's add it to our ears so mom and dad are saying that as well. What else did they say around here? What else did they say? This is my favorite of all the beer uh, slogans in the whole state of Montana's history. You beer, make it a habit. <laughs> make it a habit. Isn't that great? Love it. Love it. Yeah. How about the Centennial back in the uh, before Prohibition? <laughs> this was a man's world. Is it safe to say? Yeah. Huh? Drink Centennial beer slogan. It makes her look good. Oh, jeez! Oh, 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 and perhaps, and who am I to question? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Uh, the, the other thing that uh, that Butte was uh, Butte Brewing was really famous for was um, uh, everybody gets the used to get the Montana Standard. You still go it. I I saw a bunch of guys reading the same uh, the same paper here as uh, as we were getting ready. And uh, must have been interesting because they were all turned to the same page. Huh? <laughs> so it must be the arrest records of the obituary. <laughs> That's usually where we go. But um, the Montana Standard ran, and a couple of the other uh, few newspapers, ran a, uh, a series from the 1940s to the 1950s uh, on doodles. On doodles. This is a place, this is a place where we, uh, we, we always had gambling, one way or the other here in Butte, right? We always had gambling. I was with my cousins one day, 
And we were in a house that had a water closet. I know the Lescobars had a water closet. And, uh, and I was with some cousins, and the kids were betting, were betting how many times you could flush the water closet before mom came in and yelled at them. <laughs> hey, knock that off in there. Okay? That big old bush. People in Butte had a tendency to gamble. Okay? Enough said. All right. So, if there's a chance of winning the prize, how many Butte natives are going to line right up there? Sure they are. Oh, yeah. So, Butte Brewing Company came up with a doodle contest. And so, any citizen in and around Butte, uh, certainly in a Butte, uh, Let's call it the Butte metropolitan area, which is all of Montana. <laughs> and uh, anybody could write in and send in a cartoon in a doodle. And if it was selected each week, the Montana Standard would, would run that doodle. And they would, they would say, who, who wrote it? They would give their street and house address. They never do something like that today. So oh, yeah. Again, it was those great things of pride. And what really kept it going. You had to write it about Butte Special Beer. Mm -hmm. And you had to write it about, uh, uh, you, you, you had to write it in such a way that if you won, you got a full case mm -hmm. of Butte Beer free. Mm -hmm. huh? Isn't that a great idea? <laughs> they also said, hey, what the heck? If you bring in the biggest fish, we'll give you a case of the two. Oh, and how about the biggest deer? <laughs> Can you imagine out hunting someplace far away and bringing that nasty beer, that nasty beer in? To the what do you guys think, huh? What do you guys think? Uh -huh. Yeah. Hey, if you can win a case of good special beer, it's worth it, right? Okay. So, some of those were incredibly funny. Some of them were incredibly cute. Many of them were incredi incredibly politically incorrect. I, uh, I mentioned this uh, last night, and, um, and when you read those things, and I suggest that you all, the fact is, that's part of your assignment for today, is that uh, you keep coming back here to the archives and look through Montana standards and, uh, and look at some of those. You'll feel proud of your Butte heritage. Huh? Yeah, it's great. It tells you a lot about, uh, about what people were thinking at the time. Thus the, uh, thus the embarrassing political things, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's good. Now, breweries in view, all of them, they, uh, they were very, very civic-minded. How many of you played for a, uh, a bowling team? Anybody, anybody, bowl, anybody bowl anymore? <laughs> huh? Used to be a huge sport in Montana, and breweries sponsored many, many teams. How many of you played uh, baseball uh, that was sponsored by a, a, a brewery? Huh? Yeah, there were lots of them. There were lots of them. Hey, incidentally, here's, here's an aside. Let's all jump back in that bus a minute. Zip down to Missoula. Okay? I don't know why, but we'll zip down to Missoula. Their beer wasn't as good as it is here. But how many of you, um, how many of you remember Highlander beer? Yeah. Okay. If you drive up by Bertoglio's, you still see those big, wonderful Highlander signs, don't you? They were the distributors for Missoula's beer here in Butte. And they also were the distributors of Schlitz from Milwaukee. Remember that? And they would bring it out in hogsheads and big, uh, in, in big rail cars, and they would bring it to Bertoglio's, and they would bottle it here. So many of those Schlitz bottles say, bottled in uh, Butte, Montana. Those labels. Okay. But if you look at that, uh, if you go down and you look at that sign, you'll see that the way Highlander is written, so unique, it has that swoosh underneath of it. That's called a Dodger swoosh. Why do you suppose? Well, <laughs> so I, nobody has to nod their heads. Uh, that was the uh, rhetorical why do you suppose. Uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you why is because the brewer, uh, William Steinbrenner in uh, Missoula, um, was, uh, was just crazy about that day in the Highlanders. And Jacob Rupert, the biggest brewer in uh, New York City, um, owned the American baseball team there. And they were, the, they were the New York Highlanders. And Steinbrenner always wanted that, uh, that, that name for the baseball teams that he would sponsor in, in Missoula. So when Rupert finally changed the name of his 
baseball team, then Missoula got Highlander, and you got it painted on the side of Bertoglio's building. What was the name of uh, his baseball team, by the way? What did he change it to? The Yankees. The Yankees, huh? The Yankees. So when you look up at that sign here in USA, and you see, ah, there's, a, there's another one of those ties to, uh, to the municipality of Butte that extends clear across the country to New York. Huh? Nice, nice. What a very good beer. Anybody, anybody ever drink it? Yeah, I drank, I drank some too. That was, that was a high school sin. Um, yeah, now the... Um, we talked about the neighborhoods. Oh, let me uh, let me invite you all when we're done here in about 15 minutes um, to come up and take a look at just a few of Butte's brewing history. You'll see that um, we had a uh, we had a um, senator, not a senator, a House of Representatives a fellow from uh, from here, and uh, his name was Leopold Schmidt. Anybody you ever heard that name, Leopold Schmidt? Who was he? He built the Centennial Brewery. He built the Centennial Brewery, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, he had a couple of uh, fellows that joined him in the ownership. But he built the Centennial Brewery, and um, he was really quite, uh, quite an interesting man. Had his hands in all kinds of things, um, also, also politics. And when the state of Montana decided we're going to build a Capitol building in, uh, in Anaconda, Hey guys, that was never an anaconda. That was, that was just a test. That was just a test to see if any of you studied history. Well, you, all, you all failed miserably. Uh, we're going to build a Capitol building over in Helena. And uh, Leopold Schmidt was one of uh, four gentlemen that went around to look at different Capitol buildings ar around the West. And he got to, uh, he got to Tumwater, Washington to look at the Capitol building there, and he absolutely fell in love with the brewing water there. Best brewing water anywhere. So he came home, and he was the, uh, the emphasis behind the original Olympia Brewery, which was located right here in Butte. Huh? And there's a picture of it. This is one of their ads right here. And uh, you can see it even looks like it, the, the way Olympia was uh, was uh, was written. I have letterhead from there, beautiful letterhead, and I invite you to come up and look at this stuff when we're done. But um, he went back and sold his sold his brewery and started Olympia there. He's, as a good Montanan, he also uh, took all of his brewing family with him uh, to Olympia. And uh, and as a uh, we talked about statutes of limitations, as an enterprising Montana, he stole. He stole the slogan for Olympia beer. What is the slogan for Olympia beer? It's the water. It's the water, the water, the water that makes Olympia beer. Remember? You all sang that, didn't you, when you were a kid? He stole it from the Red Lodge Brewing Company. Back at the turn of the century, that was their slogan. And he just took it with him. He took it with him. So, an important guy important to Butte and important to uh, the Capitol building in Anaconda, or the Capitol <laughs> building in Helena. Um, very important to laws that govern brewing here in Montana um, because he fought for them. Um, Mueller was a, um, was a, uh, one of the fellows that eventually bought the, um, the Centennial and ran that. He was one of your mayors here in Butte. Also very political fought hard for, for liberal beer drinking laws and beer brewing laws. Our laws today are archaic. They're dreadful. They're horrible. They, uh, they support outside breweries instead of our own brewers right here in the state. Okay. Oop, I'm starting to get political. Okay. No, no, no more politics. But, um, but we're rich in that brewing history. And, um, and those are the kind of guys that we uh, that we got it from. Now, the um, when did brewing start here in Butte? By the way, probably should have said this quite a while ago. Are we doing on time? Okay. We're fine. Yeah, keep okay. going. Lots of time. Eighteen. Eighteen eighty-sixty-four. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a case of Butte beer here. Uh, we're going to win, but uh, but it actually started. Uh, 
Brewing in Montana commercially started in 1859, and not far from here. Uh, Johnny Grant was brewing over in, on Cottonwood Creek, 1859, pretty darn early, okay? Started here in, in uh, 1862, by 1862, we had two breweries going at Silver Bowl and continued to grow. We started going into the gulches around and, uh, and we, had, uh, we had a number of breweries starting up and they, uh, uh, they would, as soon as the ore played out, they would do what? Pick up their kettles and go to the next bonanza and start up. So this whole place was just, just riddled with breweries. And uh, so that's it's always kind of hard to say, well, how many breweries were there in Montana? Huh? We don't have the time for you guys to guess. <laughs> there were 197 in, in Montana's brewing history. And people debate about it all the time. Um, and, and the debate is if if uh, Leopold Schmidt had his initial brewery in the mining camp of Fredericton, and then he moved it moved down here um, and started one in uh, in Butte City, is that a completely new brewery? No. <laughs> oh, this is great. I see. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, we are getting political here. Okay, we know that there were 197 breweries in Montana. Sometimes there were itinerant breweries that went and bought themselves a brewer's license. Uh, and, yeah. and when the org played out, when everybody left town, they left town too. Butte had a lot of that. Butte also had difficulty with some of their names. Uh, there was the, uh, there was the, uh, the Washington Brewery, Joe Kohler's. The Washington Brewery on East Park Street. Colonel Horst had the Washington Brewery on West Park Street. Huh? <laughs> wow. There was the Western. There was the New York. There was the uh, Rocky Mountain. There was, uh, Walkerville had two breweries. Walkerville. Yeah. <laughs> One of them was called the Vienna Brewery. Huh? How Irish can you get? <laughs> I have the Vienna Brewery in Walkerville. I had that avant garde kind of a sound to it. There were shootings up there all the time. Butte, Butte had the California Brewery, right down the street here. Uh, incidentally, where are, are any of those buildings still around? Yeah. They've mostly been, uh, mostly been torn down. But, uh, but there are still a few of them around. Uh, we're in our bus again, and we're taking a tour, and, uh, and uh, we're going to stop at the, the Capri Motel. Huh? That's where the Butte Brewery used to be on Wyoming. Trade them in. Yeah. Sadly, it was torn down. You remember when they built the Capri? Mm -hmm. They tore the brewery down and built the Capri? And what did they put outside of it? Oh. Oh. Palm trees. Those palm trees. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, that Is that kitsch, the definition of kitsch? Yeah. <laughs> those, those plastic, silly looking, lit, multi lit. Uh, Multi-lit palm trees, yeah, okay, well, there's, uh, there's, there's still remnants of at least some of the brick around of, of the old brewery, but that's where that was. Uh, the Centennial, where was the Centennial? Centennial Avenue. Centennial Avenue, oh yeah, yeah. Huh? Yes, there, the Centennial uh, Concrete uh, is there, built on those same ruins. So I stopped by there today and, uh, and, and took a look at it again. I, the effect is, is anybody associated with that concrete company? Okay, because I ran over there and stole the brick. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, statute of limitations. And I talked about silly rules in Montana, silly laws. My goodness, in Montana, you could not bottle or rack or keg your beer in the same building that it was brewed in. How oh, crazy so is that? That is nuts. So you had to build another building right next to it and run a pipe, run a pipe over it, and you could do it there. Huh? Why? It makes no sense. Why was that? Why? What do you think? What do you think? To get more people to build buildings, I guess. I have researched that 
over and over and spent countless hours in archives, no one seems to know. Wow. It was just written in those early <laughs> Montana laws. But did they repeal those laws? No, they kept them for years and years and years. So even though the centennial is gone, and you can see parts, parts of the base, uh, bottom of the building, look across the street, and there's the bottling plant. Schmidt, inspectors, and gamers, bottling plant. What did they bottle there? Centennial beer. They had a pipeline. They had a pipeline over there. Golly. Government at its best. Um, yeah, where, uh, how about the Silver Bowl? Somebody mentioned it. Huh? What about the Silver Bowl? Where is it at? Where was it at? Silver Bowl. The Silver Bowl Brewery. Okay, let's, uh, we're in our bus again and we're, and we're driving. Now we have beer and we're a lot happier. And uh, do we want to turn down to, uh, turn down to Dillon? No, we're not going to take the freeway down. But we go past, past the turn off to Dillon and we look over the side of the road, we see this really, really cool big tall rock building, huh? real narrow. That's where the Silver Bowl Brewery was, okay? Yeah, and that's the malt house to the Silver Bowl Brewery. Two, two gentlemen bought that, it's called Nistler's Junction, because who was Nistler? He was the brewer, huh? Christian Nistler was the brewer. And so uh, Nistler's Junction and the uh, Silver Bowl Brewing Company, and it used to have all kinds, all kinds of uh, of outbuildings and uh, racking houses and all of that, and uh, and then it went into receivership when he died. Right next to it, sharing the same buildings, was uh, was another brewery. Okay. Crystal. The Crystal Brewery. Anybody ever hear about that? Didn't last very long. Here's one of their corner signs from that. In the corner said, I bought that years and years and years ago from somebody here in Butte. It had been completely painted over. Wow. Completely, and, it, and it said for sale. Somebody made a for sale sign up. Okay. And, uh, and I bought it sight on scene, and the guy sent it to me in Polson, wrapped in two shopping bags. Oh. So more like that, put some tape around it, sent it to Steve Lozar. Wow. And, 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 and I got. Very, very rare piece. In fact, it's most everything that you see up here is, is pretty rare. Now, as I'm just about done, I got we're nearly one minute. Um, oh, go. keep so, going. Uh, oh, I, I, you can keep going. Can stretch. Yes. Okay, well, yeah, stretch. <laughs> what's synonymous with Butte? This would be fun. What's synonymous with Butte? <laughs> mining. Mining. What? What was that last one? Mining. Mining. Copper. What, what else? This has nothing to do with my talk. I just want to hear what you guys have to say. <laughs> no, what's synonymous with you? Well, the Dumas. The Dumas. Okay. okay. Yeah, that place makes me sweat. Rodney <laughs> Dangerfield. How about unionism? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the unions were very, very strong. The brewers' unions. And so uh, when... Uh, when the plumbers and pipe fitters would uh, would go out on strike, who would also join? The brewers would join. Uh, when uh, when the electricians went out on strike, who would join? The brewers. Why do you suppose that was the case? Because they were on strike. Union supported union. That was their cousin. That was their cousin. What a great way to put personal pressure on the owners of those breweries. Than to um, than to not have the beer in your yeah. house. Yeah. Has anybody ever gotten crabby when they got off work? <laughs> they, they came home and all they all they wanted was was one of these, and they opened the ice box. And there they had ice boxes in those days. Yeah. They opened the ice box and there was nothing there. By God, you guys settle that strike. <laughs> That just tickles the heck out of me. Unions were very, very important to the breweries, and and um, it caused caused uh, a lot of upheaval, uh, some good wages, some some bad work or better working conditions. They did a lot, but they were often the uh, often the pawns in um, the brewers' unions were because of that closing down and opening up, closing down and opening up, and so. Uh, 
So how would they address that? This is positively one of my favorite signs. Huh? These used to hang all around you. Oh, that's good. Isn't that a dandy? Yeah. Isn't that a dandy? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a... I used to be on the school board, and, um, and, and I had been a union member when I was a younger man. And uh, the school board was always fighting with who? They were always fighting with the teachers' union. Yeah. Oh, I'm married to a teacher, by the way. <laughs> um, and and uh, so they, they, were always, they were always sticking me, anytime there was any kind of negotiations, I wasn't even invited. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. They, they would argue and fight, and I, Actually, I went to, I did go to one meeting, and there was a negotiator for the teachers' union, and, uh, and, and he only had one arm, and his, uh, his arm was, his coat was tied up here, and the, uh, the school district's negotiator uh, only had parts of a finger and a half, and they were, they were, they were fist at each other. I walked in, my God, these union people. They used to be tough, huh? Well, they were tough here, too. Because right out on the next street over, the, uh, when one union tried to take over uh, the, uh, the Brewers Union, and another union, that, the local that they were already with, uh, they got in a clash out here in front, uh, pretty close to where the new brewery stood, to the point where their, the, the headlines were A number one in the Butte papers of uh, fists and, uh, and men to the hospital and oh, broken bones and blood and, I mean, it was, it was dramatic, it was dramatic. <laughs> I suggest again that you go to the archives and read through some of those things. Now, finally, finally, small breweries couldn't afford canning lines and that was the case here in Butte, even though we think of them as big. So how did they, uh, how did they can their beer after 1933? They use, these things are called cone tops. Cone tops, because they could fit through a bottling line. Um, every brewery wanted to have its name out in front of, of the citizens as soon as you woke up in the morning. So you woke up, you woke up, and if you were like uh, most of the people in my family, you, uh, what was the first thing you lit up? Huh? Lit up a smoke. Yep. Uh, okay. <laughs> These are, uh, and the brewery has thousands of, uh, of brewery articles or pieces. But this is one of my absolute favorites. Somebody tore it in half, but breweries gave out thousands and thousands of matches. But these are very unique because when you open it up, every match is a bottle of Butte Special Beer. Oh, oh that's wow. awesome. Isn't that cool? That is cool. Huh? That is cool. Yeah. I thought about fixing it after a wow. fellow tore that up, but I, it has that Butte rough look to it, so I, so I, so I keep it. Um, the, uh, let's see, what else, what else did I do? Oh, ice boxes. Ruiz gave out ice picks. Huh? Wow. And you could pick the ice and, uh, and you could open what? You could open your, you could open your beer, or you could stab an intruder, or <laughs> husband or wife. Huh? Yeah, what an instrument! <laughs> when you went in, we all know Butte's famous for its hygiene, and uh, and, and, uh, and so you you got a tankard of beer, and you you drank it. You went back for another one, and they poured it. What's on top of that beer? All that darn foam. So you'd scrape that off, throw it on the floor, pour a little more, and scrape that off. With, Give it to the guy, he'd slug it down, bring it in, you'd scrape that up, and you scraped off 50 other ones. Huh? <laughs> and in the meantime, guys were eating Dutch lunches. Here the dude, and the Dutch lunches were, were salty meats, uh, hard-boiled eggs, and, um, and what did that lead to? Well, we need, we need more beer. And so you would dip in the Butte, uh, Butte Brewing Company uh, little salt dishes that were on the bars, and you would eat your hard-boiled egg, you'd drink more beer, you would pass every kind of nasty germ that there was. And then when you got done, it's just about time to go and we're about done here, you would, uh, you, would, you would pay for that cold beer that you had and you would pull out your wallet and who gave you that wallet? <laughs> the Butte Brewing Company, the same guys that gave you the comb to comb your hair, the lint brush to take, to take your... Uh, to, to take the lint off of your <laughs> suit coat. Um, 
breweries in Butte were involved in probably many of your lives. They were certainly involved in your grandfather's lives, my grandfather's lives, and aren't we happy that they did so? So, Havala, thank you. Memnam Spesia, Aspus, thank you from my heart. If you have any questions, I'll be here as long as you want me to be. And um, thanks again. Thank you.